Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. I'm Dr. Suze Gundu, Director of Researcher and Community Engagement at Digital Science, and I'm thrilled to be hosting the third in the Science Culture webinar series for the Royal Society of Chemistry. So for a little bit of background, this is following the launch of the Vision for a Great Science Culture piece that the RSC released in September 2023, and it sets out the behaviours and values that are essential to creating a positive science culture for the benefit of science itself, but also for everybody taking part. Now, we've had a couple of amazing webinars already on science culture and your career prospects and on academic leadership. But today we're going to be talking about something incredibly important, something that allows us to do the best work for the best reasons and still maintain balance. And that is a work life balance in an academic career. I'm joined by three absolutely amazing people today, Professor Kylie Vincent, Chantelle Minchin and and Dr. Lizzie Driscoll. Now, I'm just wondering, can I come to each of you for a 30 second introduction from each of you, just a bit about your background and what you're excited about talking about today? So Professor Kylie Vincent, can I come to you first? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a professor of inorganic chemistry at Oxford University, and I'm also currently associate head of department for people with um, an EDI remit there. So I'm very interested in work life balance for the, the whole department. Um, but I guess what another sort of hat that I wear um, or have worn recently is being the University of Oxford's academic champion for women in entrepreneurship. And that's really led me to think a bit about what some of the barriers to um, women taking on extra roles um, on top of a, a kind of academic job. And on top of all that, I've got some lived experience of being um, a single mother of uh, two young children. That's amazing. I'm particularly excited to hear about the entrepreneurship angle as well. Thank you so much, Kylie. Chantelle Minchin, can I come to you next? Can I get an introduction on you and the amazing work that you're doing? So I am actually a degree apprentice. I don't have my chemistry degree yet. I'm in the early stages. Um, I took a bit of a long route into chemistry. I discovered it later in life. I had a long period where I was unable to work because of disability. And um, my initial jobs within labs, I had quite a lot of um, kind of disability discrimination that I faced. And at the time, the Royal Society of Chemistry were hosting their belonging in the chemical sciences forums. So I attended that and then I had an idea to, um, to kind of establish a network for disabled scientists, enable science. Um, we released the Spotlight series before Christmas, um, which was a set of post resources for school children featuring disabled scientists and their work. That's amazing. And I think that was with our friend Andy Brunning um, at Compound Chemistry, wasn't it? He does these amazing animations and things. Um, and it's such a great resource. If you haven't seen it, definitely do take a look at that. Thank you so much, uh, Chantelle. Um, can I go to uh, Dr. Lizzie Driscoll now for a bit of an intro, please? I'm just going to double check Lizzie's been having some room dramas so I'm just going to check that she has made it to her destination. I'm not actually sure she has yet but we will catch up with her shortly and um, but just background Lizzie is a research fellow at the University of Birmingham um, and I'm sure we'll be able to catch up with her soon but I think some of the things that she wants to talk about were her own work-life balance and ways that that can be improved and also bringing in the aspects of why it is so so poor in academia as it stands. So what we're going to do today is have a bit of a 40 minute discussion. We're about five minutes into that already. And then we're going to hand over to the audience. So we're gonna have 20 minutes of audience questions. You can submit those via Slido. And we have had some that have come through already. So I'm really excited to get into those. But we do want to make sure that everybody that is here today can enjoy the event as best they can and contribute as equally as possible. So just to go over our participation agreement, we want to foster equal participation in this discussion. We will not tolerate bullying, harassment or discrimination. We will respect people's identities and experiences. We'll engage with kindness and respect. We'll keep communication professional. 
we will consider diverse cultural backgrounds and we will contribute constructively. Now, judging by the amazing questions that have already come through, we're certainly hitting that last target. So let's dive into the conversation. Now, we all know that personal circumstances can affect us all differently at work in a range of ways. Some people may have caring responsibilities. Some people may be trying to balance their neurodivergence and disability the mental health issues. And the need to balance this range of priorities in our lives has the potential to clash with the work that we do, whether it is our schedules or the responsibilities that we're able to take on. Now, there are quite a lot of expectations about what you do and don't take on around just the research that you're signing up to doing. And so I think in this discussion, we're gonna really tease out how um, some of our panelists and some of the people in our broader spheres have been able to manage those personal situations and try and minimize any negative impact on the work that they're doing and explore ways to find better well-being and balance. So let's kick off with a bit of a defining question. What is work-life balance in this world where we we kind of sign up to do the amazing research that fascinates us we're aware that there are certain things that we need to take on and that's maybe grant proposal writing paper writing but there's a huge amount that goes on around that as well and a culture that doesn't always encourage us to take time off so kylie what does work-life balance mean to you and what does it look like well, I think it means enjoying what you do. And if work feels like a slog, there's something wrong. There will, of course, as you say, there are times when you've got pressures from grant deadlines, finishing something in time for a conference, getting a paper submitted. And we do have to perhaps sometimes have patches of time where we put in a bit of an extra effort to meet those deadlines. But if that's happening all the time, then something's wrong. And so I think you, if, if you stop enjoying what you're doing with work, then you know, that's when the work-life balance has gone wrong. Work-life balance means to you, that would be great. If you can hear us, which I hope you can. I don't know whether you can, so I'm gonna go to Chantel. Chantel, you are coming at this, as you've already said, from quite a, a different background. And so I suppose in some ways, rather than doing what a lot of us have done, which is roll straight into a degree from school and not really maybe think about what we're doing, you've had the opportunity to take a step back and really decide on what you want to get out of this. Can you tell us what work-life balance means to you and particularly in the route that you have taken? I think obviously I, d I don't think work-life balance is something we ever really achieve I think it's something we have to continuously strive towards um, I think like Kylie said it's about having that balance and um, it not having a detrimental effect on your well-being and the other aspects of your life and I think when it becomes everything like your work becomes everything and you don't have anything outside of work then I think there's a problem there um, and yeah, I, obviously there's a lot of different things to balance and I try to look at it not just as taking away time, but as giving energy. You need things that give you energy and not just take time away. That's a really lovely way of thinking about it. There's that saying that you can't pour from an empty cup. And I think that's really, really relevant. Um, I was just wondering, actually, Chantelle, while we're speaking to you about work-life balance, can you tell us a little bit more about the degree apprenticeship that you're doing, the similarities and differences between that and a, a degree? So in my degree apprenticeship, I work four days a week and I have... Um, 20% of my time is designated towards study towards my degree. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of condensed. You're studying um, 90 credits um, within each year. So time-wise, it can be a little bit more pressured. But I think for me, it's given me the opportunity to develop the practical skills and to apply that knowledge. And mm -hmm. um, also what it's done is by giving me that designated study time is it's helped me kind of separate out the two things it can still be challenging at times mm -hmm. but and as a disabled person who has spent a long period of time 
unable to work I feel like it's kind of helped me catch up a bit <laughs> because yeah. I've, I've kind of you know I want to work I want to be independent and earning but I, I do want to progress academically as well so it's kind of helped me kind of amalgamate the two. I'd love to find out a little bit more about that as the conversation goes on because I think you have the dream scenario of being able to study and also work and both of those things contribute to a thing that you love doing but I have experienced I'm sure many other people have experienced the challenge between having two different roles or wearing more than one hat because you end up giving you know almost 75 percent to three or four different things and so I think we can learn a huge amount from how you're managing that and how the people around you are helping support that as well thank you so much I'm going to see whether we can um, rejoin Lizzie I think actually she's just having a couple of technical issues but I can see you backstage Lizzie I'm wondering whether we can hear you hello I can hear you okay. yeah okay. about that <laughs> all right we pivot it's all, it's all tech it's all good it's all fine we'll find a way around it eventually um I'm just wondering Lizzie can you give us a little bit of an intro because we didn't hear from you and then maybe just tell us a little bit about what work-life balance means to you in your role yeah sure so I'm a research fellow at the University of Birmingham in the Energy Materials Group chaired by Professor Emma Kendrick. And I look into the recycling of lithium ion batteries. Um, so for me, work-life balance, I know from like reflecting on it and thinking about this, it's been pretty shocking. Like when I was doing my PhD, when I started postdocing, like for some reason, like some reasons to do with like family, supporting them. But then also uh, switching from PhD to postdoc, I was still writing up. So I know I've had a pretty bad relationship in the past. And so I think work-life balance for me is thinking about the discipline that you don't, it's really easy, I think, to overwork and that you can go into actually your leisure time. And I think it's about getting that sort of healthy and happy relationship that you're not overdoing it and you're not making yourself poorly. Because that's obviously, speaking from a bad perspective, I know... I know what it's been like and it's not done me any good. So I think as well, setting the sort of expectations of what works for you. And it's, I think, speak, hearing from the other speakers, it's always going to develop that sort of relationship, the balance. Things are going to change. Life's very dynamic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, a really, really valid point to make. I keep seeing this thing on Instagram. And I don't know if it's because the algorithm's gotten to me or I've clicked on it so many times because clearly it relates to me. But it's I think it's like a lazy bunny rabbit saying, you know, don't, don't normalize the hustle, normalize having a regular job within regular hours and then having a life outside of that. Because there is something to be said about the, the culture that we work within. We've all come in on a Monday morning and asked how people's weekends have been. And there is that kind of, oh, well, I worked on this paper until 10 at night on Sunday. And you think, is that something to be proud of or is that something we need to really be questioning in our culture? Because that should not be celebrated. That's not a good thing because people are then not bringing their best selves to work on that Monday morning because they've had no downtime at all. But I suppose it's not just about downtime, is it? I would love to hear from all of you about your experiences of wearing these many hats. If I reflect on um, my time as an academic, Academic. I was you know, a senior lecturer, I had a bunch of teaching and it happened to be first year teaching predominantly, which is a, a huge beast in itself in terms of marking um, tutorials and all of that. But then I was the outreach lead and I was the public engagement person and I was senior personal tutor. And all of these things start to add up because they've all got their own workload associated with them. Kylie, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of that and how you are contributing to help people managing, uh, juggling all of those different tasks that are important but do take time? Yeah, sure. I think it's one of the challenges of the, the sort of academic career path that we do have so many different strands of stuff going on. And it's really important that we do take time to celebrate the successes. Sometimes you achieve a big goal, like submitting a paper or getting a, a PhD student finished. And, you know, it's really important we take those moments to celebrate that because it's all too easy just to move on to the next thing so i think that's one of the things that we do need to just take time to say yeah i've done that really well i'm really proud of that and and take those little moments um 
it is it, it's it's like multiple threads all woven in together that, that in this sort of job of trying to think with things that have near-term deadlines things that have long-term deadlines and being able to juggle all of that alongside the life stuff that just gets in the way that you that so often there are things in life that we just have to drop everything for if we have a sick child if you have if you're unwell yourself and i think it's it's really about being able to take the time and say well what is important what is what's what do I absolutely have to get done and what could actually just wait because I need to look after myself a little bit here. And I think that's what we're a bit self-selecting in academia for people who really push themselves. There's nobody kind of saying you must submit that extra paper, you must submit that extra grant application. We're often the kind of people who pursue academic careers are often people who are who are really self-selecting for kind of pushing ourselves too hard. And it is really important, I think, that we do recognise that and say, look, actually, you know, we, we need to just take some time to look after ourselves and I always say to my group that it's per perfectly possible to get your PhD without working weekends without working out of hours if you organize your time you're going to do the best work you're going to think the clearest you're going to be able to um, really focus in the time you are in the lab and be able to to get the best out of that time and so it should be perfectly possible to get a really successful PhD or do a really successful postdoc period without having to work anything other than a normal working week. I think you're absolutely right. I hate this notion that doing a PhD is sort of running this gauntlet, really. It should be an opportunity to dive into something that you're really interested in, something where you can contribute something novel without feeling completely burnt out. And I hate the fact that we have, you know, these, these little tropes of things like the second year blues and stuff like that. It shouldn't be the case. And I think it's really important that we're having this conversation today. Thank you so much, Kylie, for your insights. Um, I'd love to come to you now, Lizzie, because Kylie has talked about how we can almost self-select and start to prioritise the things that that kind of serve us and that are important to us, but still contribute to our research community. As somebody that's maybe slightly earlier in their career than Kylie is, do you feel that you have been given support to help you manage that? Or is this something that you and your cohort and your colleagues have tried to kind of work out while you're on the journey? Yeah, I suppose it's not so much that having sort of training that's like given to you at the beginning of the PhD. I feel like it's sort of figuring out what works for you because there's been a lot of like when I was doing my PhD you have the sort of characters that will work weekends and knowing for me I just I can't keep up with that like it's not possible like I don't live close to the campus I've got an over an hour commute for one way and you get this notion in your head and it's like oh well I'm not doing enough I'm not delivering enough just because of how we sort of monitor our sort of outputs so it's not really I suppose instilled in us and what a good life work balance is and I suppose as well with those that have gone before us if there's no sort of change in the culture it's going to just keep on going that this is the normal and it really shouldn't be like we shouldn't be like comparing ourselves to others like some days there might be surely that you're staying a little bit late in the lab but that shouldn't be the norm um so the only way as well when it's come to sort of you know understanding the work-life balance and I suppose the management I've had to then seek out that sort of training to like how do you like how understanding priorities you know what's low what can be missed actually there'll be times where things are high so it's more seeking out those sort of those learnings I suppose mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think that's that's really well put. I wanted to pick up on something you just said, which is calling it life work balance. And I'm really going to try and do that from now on. Oh, I didn't that, even realize I did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It but, was, that was really striking for me that for some reason we're still putting work first. So yeah. for our life work balance, I yes. think you are, you're absolutely right. We will always have those moments where we need to just kind of really push and, and meet a deadline, but it shouldn't be the norm. We shouldn't mm. be feeling like we're stretching ourselves all the time. And I think there are other challenges to, to take into account as mm. well. I think the fact that, and I, you know, I don't want to, to lead any answers when I ask this question, but we are all women on this call. So all, all four of us identify as women. And certainly from my experience, the horrible saying of working twice as hard to get half the acknowledgement has certainly 
rung true for my academic career. And it was because I wanted to prove myself and make sure that I was seen as a, you know, a proactive contributor to research and research life within my institutions, but you do take on a huge amount. And I also think there's lots of other factors we're not taking into account because actually achieving life work balance is not as, as equitable as we would like it to be. People are facing a whole range of different challenges, whether it's demographics, whether it's healthcare or, or caring responsibilities. Chantel, can you tell us a little bit about some of the people that you've met through Enable Science and some of the challenges we must be aware of? So I think like listening to what Lizzie said, obviously, and about it not just being the norm. So as myself, obviously, as a woman, as somebody with a disability, as somebody who's a mature student, just personally, I think there is a lot of pressure to prove yourself and to counteract kind of, not just external ableism, but the internal ableism that's kind of been embedded into you. That, um, And I think having a culture where you have to work beyond hours makes it incredibly difficult for somebody who has a disability to kind of work within an environment where they're constantly kind of having to, I suppose, erode into the needs and kind of not give themselves that time that they need to work at the best. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it was encouraging to hear from Kylie about doing the PhD within the normal work hours because, mm -hmm. you know, if, some, if that's something that I wish to pursue in this future, um, I mean, I've got my degree, I've got my work, and I've got my, uh, you know, my work with Enable Science. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different hats there. And I think I was kind of hoping when I finished my degree to kind of take the foot off the gas pedal a little <laughs> bit and um, have a bit of a slower pace. So that was encouraging to hear. But I think, yeah, a lot of people really, it's, it's that internalised ableism, that externalised ableism, where if you say, actually, I need to take this time for me right now, it's it's kind of not just viewed upon negatively, but it's kind of detrimental to your career. There's this expectation, um, I think, within the sciences that you, particularly at the early stages of your career, I think, that you really kind of work, work, prove yourself constantly. You need to... There's, there's not really, I think, a lot of a lot of kind of notion of flexible working and kind of all these things really that I think would support disabled scientists and many of them are, you know, already working in academia. They've overcome some significant challenges. I remember hearing from one scientist who studied their degree um, without a sign language interpreter, and they were deaf, so they relied upon their friends' notes to to achieve their degree and just all these things that make it just incredibly difficult anyway and not having that flexibility not having that it, it just basically it's just a barrier that either prevents people from pursuing in science or it really erodes into your life your mm -hmm. life and your energy levels and your health ultimately and these people are doing incredible things but you do wonder like how much would they have been able to have done if they had that flexibility in the beginning? Yeah, you talk about flexibility. I'm wondering, do you mind if I kind of tease a, a little bit more of that thought um, from you? Because we've been through a, a pandemic four years ago where so many things kind of ground to a halt unless people found a way to be more flexible and to pivot to different ways of working. Do you think, as awful as it sounds, it was a, a terrible you know, global incident and people are still feeling the impact of it today, but do you think that that change in how people are able to work has actually had any legacy even now on opening up the ways that we can work and, and maintain a better life-work balance? I think with the economy how it is at the moment, that flexibility is kind of in danger at the moment i think it had initially led to increased flexibility but i think with yeah with the um economic pressures i think that it's kind of been eroded and i think again at the same time in science there is this this view that you 
earn your dues <laughs> and to earn your dues it's not enough to just do enough you have to constantly be going above and beyond and yeah it's, it's ultimately just not feasible to continue I mean even if you look at a PhD I mean can you do part-time PhDs yeah you can <laughs> yeah it's it's you know, there's this thing I can't imagine anyone. I, I don't know anyone who's done a part-time PhD. Everyone that I know has done um, full-time study in it. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people have done it um, almost in a similar way to how you're doing your degree apprenticeship. But I think, and again, I, I really want to pick up on this um, as the conversation develops. I think there's always the challenge of trying not to give all of the different part-time roles that you have full-time commitment because they're not designed in such a way that they actually enable you to engage with them in a part-time capacity. So while they do exist, I think that they could still do with a little bit more development for sure. And I, I also think that the regression to the way that we used to do things is certainly evident within sort of academic research. And it is a real shame because it was an opportunity to really start to equalize things and open things up for everybody to participate yeah. in more meaningfully. And yeah, I think, sorry. Uh, oh, no, 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 go on. I think um, whilst it was such a horrendous time of COVID for everybody, I think the slower pace of life and stuff I found, I did find beneficial just traveling to work. It was easier. Um, I think as well, for me, when people were talking about what they did at the weekends, everybody was in kind of the same boat. Whereas I think now people are talking about all these fanciful things that they go out and do in the weekend. Because I don't think it's just the pressure of people doing lots of things in the work. There's a lot, like for me, when I'm not working, I, I like to relax. <laughs> Whereas a lot of the people I work with will be going out doing lots of different sports and lots of different activities, which is brilliant. But when you come and they ask you what you've done at the weekend and you feel, oh, I haven't really got anything to say, you kind of feel a bit left out. <laughs> so, um, and a bit lazy. So I think for me, it was, it was good in that way as well, because I felt that I had more in common with the people that I was talking to. Yeah, absolutely. I remember, you know, you'd kind of jump on your team call on a Monday and we'd all go, that yoga with Adrian yesterday was a bit tough, wasn't it? And it was suddenly this thing that was sort of uniting everybody. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, Kylie, can I come to you next? You're in a position where you said yourself you have had to balance caring responsibilities. You're now in a position, you know, as professor of, of inorganic chemistry and this academic champion for women in entrepreneurship, where you're able to set the culture that you want to see, that you want to propagate within these cohorts of people. When you were managing your life work balance, did you feel that you had the support or did you have to really kind of forge ahead in that? And as a kind of additional point, do you think relating to what Lizzie and Chantelle have said, we need to maintain these, these certain aspects of so-called success in our research careers, but are we measuring success appropriately or do you think we can change the way that we do that? Yeah, there's lots of bits to that question. So I guess from my own experience, I've actually found the flexibility of an academic career absolutely crucial to kind of managing this single parenting and, and a very busy job. And we've, in some ways, I think we have gained a bit from that pandemic period that, you know, we can sometimes work from home if we've got a sick child, we can sort of, you know, we can, we can manage to... Um, juggle things a little bit we can have a quiet today working from home occasionally but actually we also have to be a bit careful that we're then not using that as a way of eroding some of our looking after ourselves so i hear colleagues sort of say oh i've got a cold so i'm going to join that meeting online but actually maybe if you're sick you should be resting and recovering and, and not trying to join online so i think we have to be really careful that we do keep some boundaries to look after ourselves through that but having said that, certainly, I know there are periods in, in academic careers when it can be really difficult to have flexibility, particularly if you're in a really lab focused role. But certainly where I am now, where it's more sort of managerial and supporting other people, I can be flexible. So I have really strict hours where I start work early in the morning after I drop my kids to the school bus. I finish work at four o'clock or 4.15 at the latest every day to be able to go home to my children. And that's so important to me that I'm there for them. And they love that, that mummy's there to pick them up from the school bus. And 
Um, I think that's one of the wonderful things of the flexibility that I can say I'm leaving now. And I think we've got much better at setting, sort of putting meetings into family friendly hours and some of those things. There's still work to be done. And we need to really work on those role models of the positive cases, making sure that people are aware that people do PhDs part time, people do postdoc positions part time. I'm trying to make sure that when we advertise postdoc positions, at least in my team, that we make it very clear that there's an opportunity to do less than full-time work in those positions. I think it's really important that we showcase those role models of, of you know, cases where people have done things in flexible ways. And you know, as much as the academic career is tough and busy and juggling lots of things, I've given lectures with you know, undergraduate lectures with a, a five-year-old sitting on my feet and I've you know we can kind of be flexible and juggle those things because actually it can be a very supportive community and I've through patches of really difficult family stuff in my life I've really benefited from the support of colleagues who've been very very um sort of um welcoming and supportive and and you know helping through those difficult times and I think that's really important too that we're all there for each other because everyone has difficult life patches whether it's illness or sick parents or children who are unwell and you know we put a lot of focus on supporting people when they come back from maternity leave or paternity leave but actually you know having children doesn't get necessarily easier as they get older they're always going to be really difficult patches of time and so we need to be aware of that and, and again sort of really celebrating and making visible that flexibility that that is there there is an element of normalizing and and that aspect of role modeling is kind of overlooked but again not to to dwell too much on the pandemic but one of the greatest things i think i remember watching that um news reporter talking about something i'm sure was was very interesting and important and his kids came running into the room and we'll always remember that it's just that moment of of normalization of people's lives. The other thing that I think is a really nice thing to see more of is in people's email signatures, you know, my working hours may not be your working hours. So if in doubt, have a nap, you know, you don't need, I'm not expecting a response from you at 2 a.m. And I think things like that are incredibly important, as you say. We um we're having <laughs> we're also just in the in the back channel of this conversation we're all just sharing things we love doing and there's a lot of people that love hugging their cats at the weekends just <laughs> on this panel at the moment i'm in boston at the moment so i can't hug my cat but i can't wait in a week's time that's all i'm going to do for my life work balance um for a good day um, so i'm just wondering lizzie can you tell us a little bit more about some of the pressures that you feel are kind of pushing on your life work balance as maybe somebody that's in that earlier career stage do you think that the measures of success can maybe change to better accommodate for a greater life work balance yeah I think I think certainly because like during my my PhD I did obviously a lot of lab work but then I also had we spoke about different hats here so I, I do wear a sort of outreach hat as well and if at the time, like I'm spending an hour doing some engagement work, well, is that is that work? Well, actually, we need to reflect that. Yes, that is work. It is part of our sort of schedule. And it seems like at the time, it always felt like, oh, am I doing some sort of Mickey Mouse work? Is this not valued the same as when I'm in the lab? And I think looking back at it now, I'm like, certainly it is. And I think it's from sort of when you get recognised for you're not just a researcher slaving away doing an experiment. You are also, you know, you have more, more going on, like, for example, being able to engage. And I think once that work gets recognised, well, then actually we can measure our output, sort of our, the life work balance. I'm going to flip it back <laughs> to that actually, you know, we're doing a pretty good job in what we're doing in work. And it, it's down to, I suppose, how we measure it. And I suppose from the classic sort of academic look, we measure it on paper outputs, but actually we should probably measure it on other things like how many, I'll take from my personal example, um, how many kids have you delivered outreach to? Uh, what other meetings have you been involved in EDI? and i uh, What students have you support, supporting? And I think also the beauty with the academic role is there's so many facets to it that we actually need to appreciate that outside the lab it is still work yeah i oh gosh yeah 
you kind of preach into the choir here. As a person, when I was in academia that was desperately trying to balance research and teaching and engagement, which are seen as three equally important pillars culturally in research, I don't think that is necessarily reflected in how we measure achievements and impact so we would have a, a lot of you know how much money have you brought into the department and how many papers have you published from that grant funding rather than you know what is the the quality of your teaching how many how many lives have you maybe impacted how many outreach activities have you taken part in and these things don't matter unless or until we start to add meaningful value to them. And so we need these things to appear in things like workload models. We need them to appear in appraisal criteria. We need to make sure that engagement and outreach opportunities are not only useful and relevant when people are trying to gather ref impact case studies. You know, We need these to be things that are taken seriously and are valued as these different facets of a person's research career. And I suppose that's not to say that every person has to contribute to all of these things equally, but as Kylie said, having flexibility and being able to almost shape your own flavor of academic career could be one way to, to be more inclusive and to help people not take these things on as spare time nice to have. You know, they are really valued by the community and by our profession as well. You talked about EDI initiatives and Chantelle, this is something that you have been working on a huge amount. You know, you are a, a vocal advocate. You've set up this organization that's really trying to advocate for all the different challenges that people are facing and that need to be considered so that they can be um, involved and included in the research that we're doing. Do you think we're doing enough to ensure that people are able to do these really important things or is there something else that we should be doing culturally? So I work for a very supportive employer who has allowed me additional time for revision when it comes to exams in the past and yet I'm here today on using annual leave to attend today because I am not high enough in my career to kind of be able to say you know can I can I do this and have that negotiation power so I think obviously there's still more that needs to be done in that regard because in an ideal world I wouldn't be using my free time to come here today as lovely as it is talking to you all um, and I think you know one of the things that I'm having to learn is how to say not necessarily no but not yet to people when they've asked me so um, when people ask me to speak at things because I'm like this is my free time um, not, not yet <laughs> and I need that time at the moment and I am somebody that likes to do a lot of different things so I am, I'm kind of trying to put together a not yet list because my enable science work is all in my free time so um obviously I'm having to I think initially I was like oh I want to do this I want to do that I want to do this um and you know other people who are incredibly passionate and bring a lot of ideas and I think it's kind of having to kind of realize I, you know i'm going to put that on my later list and that's kind of what i've tried to develop now a list of ideas that i have that i'm like oh because i put them on the list and i know that i've not forgotten them i've not said no to them i'm just kind of putting them to one side for now um and it, it can be incredibly difficult because obviously as a degree apprentice i get my 20 percent study time but there still might be studies that gets carried over a bit into my free time so it for me, it's kind of trying to monitor my energy levels and trying to think, right, where am I at today? And a lot of this has come through. I don't think I could have done it when I was younger. I think a lot of it has come through like lived experience and I still struggle. Today, I'm very tired. <laughs> I'm going to admit, I'm very tired today. Um, and it's kind of learning, okay, today I really need to rest or today I really need to push through. Or I was, I was going to do this really difficult thing today. I really need to push through with it. Or actually, I'm just not in the space to do that today. I'll do a lot of little easy jobs and get them out of the way instead. Um, it, it's kind of trying to be, and it, it's quite dynamic. And there's a lot of kind of management involved with like keeping track of the energy levels, trying to judge what's going to work best in this situation. And I think a lot of that, I just don't think I would have had the, the skills to do when I was younger. And I think supporting people so that there's not so much pressure on them to kind of um 
and supporting them to learn those skills as well because I think a lot of mine has just come through trial and error and I think there's a lot more we could do to support people earlier on in their careers so that maybe they get to where they're going a little bit faster than I have. <laughs> yeah but I mean you say faster but at the same time I think all of the experience that you're bringing into your role now and the experience you'll take beyond that is so valuable as well because as you say you have learned from that and if you decide that you want to stay in research in whichever capacity you'll be able to propagate far better working practices so that you can support people and, and support a more inclusive environment so I think it's actually really valuable. There is sort of unanimous shock at the fact that you have had to take annual leave to take part in this. We've all been in the chat just now going, this is absolutely shocking. But it does remind me of when I moved from academia to industry, I was so used to very, very nervously putting in requests for annual leave that we are absolutely entitled to. And I remember, I think it was maybe my CEO at Digital Science going, you know, you don't really have to ask to take annual leave. It's yours to take. Just let us know when you want to take it. And it was such a, a shocking difference to how I had approached time off that I'm entitled to. But that really healthy approach was something I had to almost readjust my expectations around. Um, so I think it's really interesting. So I hope that next time you do take part in something like this, you do not have to take annual leave, Chantelle, because it's such a valuable part of what you're doing and such a, a great contribution to the community conversation. So we are going to move over to questions shortly, but just as we gather those, I just wanted to pick up on one last thing from our panellists, and that's you, Kylie, because you've talked about the women in entrepreneurship. Can you tell us particularly why it is important when we think about technology transfer, why we need to make sure that we're maintaining a good life-work balance? Well, I guess it's sort of an extension of what we've just been talking about, the the sort of stuff that's outside what we see as our core job that we kind of somehow think that we shouldn't be doing within the time of our core job and so it's whether it's outreach work whether it's being on an RSC panel or whatever it is that we're doing or whether it's taking some bit of research through to commercialization that's all stuff that is actually really relevant to the academic career and to what we're here to do and for many people there'll be that real excitement of seeing their science go right through to an application um, and that's not a kind of peripheral thing it actually should be a core part of our job um, but Again, it's about making sure that those metrics we use for success are correct and that, that patents, that commercialization, that all of that can be rated as another thing that is a valid part of our the way we measure our, our academic success alongside the outreach and the, the panels and all the other things we do to, to dedicate our time. Um, and I guess, again, there are probably some specific challenges to women around the fact that more caring responsibilities fall on women and the fact that, you know, we're often worrying about sort of who's picking up the kids tonight, who's who's cooking dinner for, for a sick parent, whatever we're thinking about. Um, and that any of those extra things are just that little bit harder then to take on. And so the, the academic champion role that I've been doing um, was set up within Oxford University when we realised that we didn't have an equal number of women as founders and co-founders of our spin-out companies. And actually that we really need that in order to make sure that we're getting the best out of our innovators in a university environment. And so it's really important that we're supporting everybody from all sorts of backgrounds to be able to to do what they want in their careers and it, you know it won't be for everyone not everyone wants to start a company but actually if you do want to start a company you need to have the opportunity to do that and, mm -hmm. yeah. I think there can be quite an underrepresentation as well of women entrepreneurs and I think the fact that you're factoring this in is incredibly important because if we're trying to create solutions for society 51% of society is women and so we want to make sure that the things we're creating have that lived experience involved and associated in their development as well so yeah I think it's brilliant right it's over to our audience questions and our audience are covering the entire globe at the moment I think the furthest person we have um, away from the RSC office is Brahima who is out in Mali so hi Marley from Boston. Um, if you are further away than Marley, let us know because we love to find out where everybody is joining us from. So we're going to go to our first question and anybody can jump in on this. Um, so many personal circumstances can affect our ability to achieve a life 
work balance. How do we achieve a life work balance equally in the workplace? How do we achieve equity in that? I might come to, I'm going to come to you first, Kylie, but I'd love to hear from all of you, actually. Well, I guess it is important that we are thinking about workload models. Too often we do just kind of assume that everyone can just take on that extra little bit and that extra little bit and that extra little bit. And actually, at, you know, we can't take on everything. We can't do a, an amazing job of everything. Um, and so we do need to be thinking about that. We need to be thinking very broadly about all the different bits that we value in an academic career and making sure that we are treating those things fairly. And so I think that does come back to having work um, having sort of workload models that treat everybody fairly and and look at the the successes of, of what we want to be as an institution fairly uh, in terms of the work that everyone's contributing. Mm -hmm. Chantelle, what do you think about this equity in, in life work balance in the workplace? I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, so personally, I think I have faced quite a lot of, like I said, I've had some disability discrimination in the past. I've been iced out by colleagues. I've had a lot of difficulty. I had to stay off work once. And um, the EDI officer told me to stay off work because they just weren't willing to talk about disability and alternative ways of working. Um, so ultimately, I think when you're in a new work environment and you have to go up to somebody and you have to ask, you know, um, you know, what are your reasonable adjustment procedures and you have to go through that journey and you often have to educate your line managers at the same time and take them through that journey. I think ultimately it can just be embedded into, you know, performance reviews. We can just be asking everybody, you know, how do you work best? Is there anything you think would help you work better? And I think it would take a lot of the pressure off as a disabled person having to come in, having to, you're new to the workplace and you're kind of seen as making demands. Obviously it's not that, but that's kind of how it comes across. Um, and like stirring things up and mixing up the way people are working and changing things and you've just come in. And I think having that as a natural process and not like a separate process would um, just make it so much easier and prevent some of those um, working relationships from being eroded at the very beginning. Um, I also think when you look at CPD, CPD is very focused on academia. And I think these outreach activities and these EDI, if we embedded that into CPD, then employers would be more invested in kind of supporting you to do all these additional activities. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done and mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. uh, going to be a continuous process. And I think advocating for yourself is very difficult. So I always look at, you know, advocating for some, pretend I'm advocating for somebody else and push for these things. But I think a younger me just wouldn't have felt comfortable um, yeah. speaking up and doing these things and would have probably just ended up leaving the workplace, essentially. So I think that's really important to remember that a more inclusive workplace benefits everybody and the work that we're doing as well so the impact on society is greater as well so really it should be everybody's challenge to take on rather than just the people that fall into certain demographic categories that have to constantly advocate for themselves because there is kind of a burden and a fatigue to that as well so i think absolutely and i'm really pleased that actually with enable science you're able to provide tools for continuing professional development as well which i think is brilliant and um, lizzie did you have anything to add to that response i suppose one thing i was thinking of because i when i saw that um question i was thinking of what what went with my personal experiences like having to leave get into work with my phd say at nine and then having to leave a little bit earlier to you know, help my mom get up from work and you feel like when you get home you're like well hold on i left two hours early i need to make up for that time but you know we spoke about covid the impact of that and i think really with the answer with this equity is thinking about flexibility you know, being honest with yourself and, you know, Kylie mentioned as well, like, you know, you don't need to overdo your PhD, you'll still get your PhD. And I think, you know, have the confidence in what you're doing, even if you're having to leave a little bit early for caring responsibilities, is, you know, <clears throat> you, you're, you're heading in the right direction and not to feel guilty that some days that that will happen where you will have to leave early. 
and where you know life takes over a bit more um so i think flexibility is probably my answer for this yeah definitely thank you so much for for all being able to to answer so honestly as well and we have a few more shout outs to do before we go to our next question we have prakash from india hi we've got ahmed from glasgow who says afternoon and tomiko from texas um who is agreeing with many of the statements being made in this discussion we've got some other questions that have come in from um some of the other people that are watching this webinar so this again i'm probably going to start with you kylie and um, the question is to what extent are line managers and supervisors responsible for work-life balance and is there anything they can do to help their staff and I think you've already mentioned a lot about the role modeling um, but do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah I think they're really really critical in <laughs> supporting work-life balance or life-work balance in their staff um, it's really important that line managers are clear um, sort of clearly on the same page as their staff about those holiday days that everyone is entitled to as you mentioned earlier Suze that this idea that you know we shouldn't have to be feeling embarrassed about asking for days off that we're entitled to so it's really important that line managers are really clear about that with their staff and that they're you know there will be times when it may not be appropriate to take holidays and line managers will have to say sorry that's a really bad time because we really need you here for, for something but actually you you're totally entitled to take that holiday just not right at that time so so that you know there, there will sometimes have to be discussions but it needs to be really clear that everyone is entitled to time off um i think it ideally line managers would be really clear about what sort of work hours are uh, expected and uh, appropriate and that those should be sensible work hours and that they should you know line up with what's in someone's contract i think we're often you know older academic contracts have some really problematic things in like you'll do the, the work that's required of your boss and you know, we, we, we shouldn't have contracts like that anymore we need really clear contracts that that so that everybody knows what they're entitled to it and what they're what they um you know what's expected um and then also line managers need to have that personal touch that that empathy with the difficult life circumstances that people go through that there will be times when someone is not performing to the best of their ability because they're struggling with mental health challenges because they've got a sick relative because someone's died because something awful's happened in a relationship or something and you know from the small life things to the huge life things as a line manager you really need that empathy with your staff in terms of really sort of understanding that we've all been there we've all had really difficult moments and that will impact people's work but if we support people in the right way we can get them back on track again and and so i think that yeah line managers are absolutely crucial in all of that yeah definitely mm -hmm. oh my gosh yeah yeah <laughs> it's just so many things that everyone's saying I I think, gosh, yeah, absolutely right. I think um, emotional intelligence is massively overlooked as a, a skill that people really should possess. And actually, in the last webinar, there was a huge amount of discussion about leadership qualities within academia. I think emotional intelligence and empathy is such a core requirement to help people do the best possible work that they can do in a range of very human circumstances, because that's mm. all we are. They're just human. Can I just add another tiny thing yeah, there, actually, that, um, <laughs> that just made me think um, that also making people feel comfortable to talk about what circumstances are impacting their work. And I've had several women in my team say to me, I'm so glad that I have a woman as a, a supervisor because I can tell you that I've got my period and it's really bad and I can't come into the lab because I'm really struggling. And actually, it shouldn't matter who your line manager is. You should be able to say that to anyone. And I think we all need to get better at comfortable conversations about all sorts of topics that, that might affect people, whether it's menopause, whether it's periods, whether it's disabilities, whether it's mental health issues. Um, these things can affect people at all times in their lives and, and, and we need to be open to that and be able to have conversations so that people feel comfortable talking to, to line managers about those things. Absolutely. And I do think I would love an entire session on just like the, the women's health challenges as well, because we just can't talk about things 
ever. And I do, I'm with you in terms of normalizing, you know, those conversations and creating safe spaces to have those conversations as well. Thank you so much, Kylie. Um, Chantal, I'm going to come to you with our next question. So the question is, how can positive changes in science culture be advocated and worked for without increasing the workload on those already struggling? So I, I think it's I think it's very difficult. I think there is a lot of onus on the person that is kind of needing the advocacy to do the advocacy at the moment. And I think obviously, um, and in terms of other minority groups, I'm still learning how to do this, learning how to be a better ally. I think when we look at leadership as well, I think the need they need better training. I think a lot of times people are placed in leadership because of their academic abilities and they haven't had that training on the people side of things so I said they're not aware of the reasonable adjustment procedure they don't know how to go about it and then they kind of unfortunately make mistakes along the way and that impacts upon you as an individual and you're trying to go through this procedure and educate this other person at the same time um I think, yeah, if, if they're trained on the reasonable adjustments, I think reasonable adjustments, I don't think that you should have to ask for the policy to get the policy. I don't see why that can't be sent out in the onboarding information when you start with somewhere. Um, again, it, it removes the onus of you having to stand up and ask for it and you having to hunt round for it if it's not obvious. Um, essentially, it's having these things in place initially. Um, so, for example, in some places I've worked, there's been um, a lady with pregnancy issues and they haven't really thought about maternity in the lab environment until this person was pregnant because previously there was men working there and then they've had to kind of act in response. And I think it's impossible to do everything in anticipation of something, but I think having the certain things that you would expect in place and I think certain things... For example, if somewhere had a prayer room or a quiet room available, you automatically recognise that this is someone that is willing to make these adjustments and you're more likely to ask for them. So I think it's kind of having a that education and training and that willingness to kind of meet someone part way. Like I'm very lucky that my employer um, actually, my current employer, when I started working there, they actually made the effort to reach out to the National Autistic Society and asked um, for my permission for them to come in and do like a bit of a workplace survey and um, to see how the workplace fitted me. And I was just really touched actually that they'd made that effort to kind of proactively go and do something and that I wasn't kind of in this new job, adjusting to this new job and then kind of being the neurodiversity trainer to everybody, like explaining everything to everybody. Um, which is a really weird situation to be in when you're starting somewhere and you're just getting to know somebody and all of a sudden you're like, these are your line managers and you're kind of teaching them. And <laughs> it, it's just it's just really strange. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think not having to always just advocate for yourself and having that transparency as to what is actually available for people to access in terms of support yeah. or even just being honest about what the the state of things is you mentioned um the person going through a pregnancy and how they hadn't really considered that i used to work in a place i will not name but they had a huge underrepresentation of women in their faculty and they only had men's toilets on most of the floors and so I worked on the ground floor and the ladies toilets were on the third floor and if you're trying desperately to pee in between lectures you're gonna have to go all the way up to the third floor during the queue of now increasing women you know as they start to, to diversify their workforce and it took us literally being late for lectures and things for them to go maybe we need more women's toilets it's you know you just don't think about the situation until it's so starkly presented in front of you it's yeah. why and i think um, when we're, when we're building infrastructure talking about the toilets as well i think in academia and the chemical industry now when we're when we're building new infrastructure we're thinking about sustainability mm -hmm. but does accessibility really come into the question when we're building mm -hmm. these structures or is it Kind of an afterthought it's, it's things like that really as well i think at the same time and there was actually um 
somebody that I spoke to and they actually talked about how their colleagues had recognised that they were having to stand up for themselves in meetings and it was putting them in an awkward position and they nominated a kind of an, an equality person in each meeting to kind of so that it wasn't always the pressure on the person kind of um that was having these comments said about them to stand up and say it was kind of shared around um because they were having issues at the time with um the the note taking always going to kind of the female or the female presenting colleagues in the workplace so it it became more of a um yeah. shared responsibility i think that's brilliant um Lizzie, I wanted to come to you with one very, very last question, but we are quite short for time. So as you answer this, what I'd love is for each of you to just think of the one take home that you would love people to, to leave this webinar with. So the question is, 30 seconds or less, why okay. is life work balance so much harder to achieve in academia than elsewhere? And I think we have covered a lot of things, but if you can just bring a couple of those thoughts together, that would be great. Okay, so I think because I normally get a message from my partner at the end of the day, like, have you left yet? And he works in industry. And so I think part of this is with academia, we kind of think it's quite an individual thing. The outputs are measured on our deliverables. Where in industry, when I was talking to him, it was like, well, no, we're all working together as a team towards one direction. And so I think that comes into it. We're like, oh, I can do more. I can keep going. Uh, and I think that's why it's really hard to achieve. Um, and it's, I suppose it's just how we measure it and I suppose how we combat that maybe we recognize other outputs like recognizing teaching quality engagement rather than just thinking research and papers but I think it's poor because we think it's individual yeah, I think that's that's a brilliant way of summing that up, actually. Um, OK, I'm going to come to each of you to give me your final take home from this um, session, what you would love people to maybe do or to consider as they go about their their working lives in their particular research bubble. Um, so, Kylie, I'll come to you first. What would you like people to take from this? I think I would go back to where I started with this and say, make sure you're enjoying what you're doing. And if you're not enjoying it, then something's wrong and you need to make a change to that life work balance. Brilliant. Um, Chantelle, can I come to you? Yeah, so um, I would just highlight, obviously, the need to kind of be better allies and to take the pressure off disabled persons. And also that need, Obviously, as Kylie said, there's going to be periods of times where you are working more intensively, but it shouldn't be all the time. And to try to find things that give you energy as well as taking your time, just to reiterate that point. Brilliant and really valid. And Lizzie, can I come to you? Yeah, so I suppose similar to Kylie, you know, thinking about being happy, making sure it's healthy what you're doing honesty and flexibility maybe we can have some free h's like the like have another phrase like life life work maybe happy healthy honest <laughs> oh i love that that's absolutely <laughs> brilliant and we did have a bunch of other questions we had a question from uh, rhoda in dublin we had some from linkedin we haven't gotten to those yet so i'm hoping that we can maybe carry on the discussion either in the linkedin comments or somewhere through the rsc um, but i just wanted to say thank you so much to professor kylie vincent to Chantelle minchin to dr lizzie driscoll to jim lizzie hiran lewis and everyone at the rsc for supporting this and most importantly to our amazing audience for your brilliant and fascinating questions. My take home would be get a cat that sits on your keyboard at half past five every day because that'll stop you working. It's great. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We will be back next month for another edition of the Science Culture webinar series. But until then, keep the conversations going, keep being brilliant, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.